and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, welcome back. You've been on vacation. <laughs> uh, it's so exciting to be recording an episode with you again. Oh, it's How was actually it? really How nice. Was, we, I missed was, you for real. I missed you for real. Oh, thank you. I actually, um, I think this might be the first time in my life that I've been happy to come back from vacation. <laughs> uh, honestly, a, a lot happened while I was away. It was beautiful, by the way. I went to the Seychelles for two weeks. It's not, I'm, I'm not a huge beach vacation person, so it wasn't a place that I would normally go to, but it was absolutely gorgeous. Highly recommend it. I think it's ruined me for all other beaches in the future, but I am happy to be back and recording with you once again. And I missed you too, Joy. Thank Joy. you. It's great to have you back and you sound great. You know what I did this week? Uh, I, I can take a guess, but go ahead. I did a deadlift. <laughs> I did some. Um, I, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been lifting weights at the gym, and I, uh, I did. T- I'm not going to say what my. Dare current, I was about to say. I, dare no, I ask? I'm not you going. What your I'm still very weak. I'm not going to say what my uh, PR is, my personal record is, but it was very satisfying. I felt good, and now I'm like gonna keep doing. I've been doing weights for a little while. But Joe, is it? Is it a real deadlift if you're not bragging about it on Twitter? <laughs> when I'm when I hit bragging level, I will definitely brag. But uh, I bet everyone can figure out where I am going with that because we are going to be speaking today <laughs> with one of the uh, foremost. When I think of our, this guest, I think of it as many things, but I think of him as one of the foremost uh, deadlift advocates in public. I of course know exactly who you're talking <laughs> about. Um, this is someone. It, you know, a, certainly a personality and a character, yes. especially online, on Twitter. I think we've both at various times <laughs> been Blo- blocked by him, but unblocked, uh, as lately. have have quite a few people. Yeah. So I think I tweeted this while I was on vacation, actually. But one of the craziest things to me about 2023 is that I find myself not only unblocked by this guest, but also nodding my head yes. vociferously in agreement with him on a variety of topics. 2023 is a very weird year for that very reason, because it's like, oh, yeah, totally right. Anyway, we just got to get right into it. So Let's we are, it. of course, speaking with the one and only Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He's a professor at NYU. He is an advisor at the Tail Risk Fund Universa. He is the author of several books, including The Black Swan and Anti-Fragile and Fooled by Randomness. And he is a deadlift advocate. And he has also gotten into cycling lately, which is interesting. And he is a flaneur. I don't even know where to start. Nassim, thank you so much for joining us. Every time I see the word flaneur, I forget what it means. What does it mean? Uh, I, yeah, I have to remember exactly what it means because the original <laughs> uh, designation is for someone who walks around aimlessly. Okay. <laughs> and I, I try to generalize it to someone who does things aimlessly just for the fun of it without the prescribed plan. And and if you find something interesting, then you go with it. So that's funny because I started off by saying that you I could think of you as a deadlift advocate. But this year you're getting into road biking, which is interesting because, you know, it's kind of very different type of exercise. It's not the type of exercise I associate you with. It's a little... I was a cyclist. Why? What's the deal with getting into cycling? I was a cyclist when we met last, which is about 15 years ago, and uh, I had a near miss with a truck. And then I switched to a combination of a lot of walking and some... uh, like intense but, but short episodes of weightlifting, full right. body weightlifting. And then I, you know, had to follow the evidence, started reading the literature, and I realized that uh, weightlifting is not good for your heart. Oh. So it's actually, it's not good at all on its own, but it's, it's needed, it's necessary. But, you know, that's the evidence. It causes aortic stiffness, a lot of things. You know, there's an adaptation mm-hmm. when you want to lift very heavy objects, your body adapts by doing things are not uh, helpful for long-term survival. So we need to compensate. And how, how do you compensate? Instead of just walking, something a little more intense than walking, but not very intense. So here you have a barbell of a lot of, lot of um, aerobic exercise, low grade, and the occasional full body weight lift. So it's just a variation on what mm. I was doing, but you got to follow the evidence. I mean, the literature is stark that weightlifting is not for your heart. 
but that a uh, because it causes some adaptation by your heart that are not very good. It causes uh, long-term heart failure. And uh, if you adapt by doing uh, overcompensate by doing aerobic exercise, which is more naturalistic, then you got both. Hmm. I think flexibility is also a sort of underrated component of that as well. But so I'm trying to think how how to take it from here. And I'm very I'm going to try to avoid doing a lot of media navel gazing in this interview. But there is one question that I have to ask, just because I think it feeds in to um, a wider point about your online presence. But why did you block me and Joe? And why have we been unblocked? Uh, I think well, a, large, a lot of my blocking is not done by me directly, but by some automated uh, boss. You have to understand that I got besieged by uh, finance uh, people. And, and you know that I don't get along with uh, the general finance crowd. And by the crypto people, particularly after mm-hmm. I took positions that are not very favorable to the crypto people. So you do block uh, and cleans up my feet, just block things. And I had uh, someone who happened to be in Ukraine at the time helping me, uh, you know, do automatic uh, blocking. And believe, believe it or not, the best thing to do with your Twitter feed is block groups because then, then, then things become cleaned. Oh, I believe it for sure. <laughs> so. So well, unfortunately, that, that you guys, but then I unblock people when I realize it went too far. Thank you. So the first reaction is what I call via negativa. It's like you close the door and then you let in uh, you, those you think that were excluded or, or uh, would not degrade the feet. Hmm. That's a great answer. It doesn't and- have anything to do with, with disagreements. It has to do with style also. Right. But I think the people that, that annoy me the most are those who nitpick because a diverse conversation and nitpickers are, I mean, trolls, you can see the trolls, nitpickers, people don't notice the nitpickers. Well, since you mentioned it already, let's just start with the, the crypto thing, yes. because what's interesting to me about your disagreements with crypto people, Bitcoin maximalists, et cetera, is many of them, I think, looked up to you. And they read yeah, know, anti-fragile, they and that, right? And they they read anti-fragile, and they read fooled by randomness, and they read the black swan, and that informed them that it's like, okay, we need to adapt, uh, get it, get into this currency that's very hard, that is anti-fragile, Bitcoin, the ultimate anti-fragile currency, and so to their mind, they were many of them looked uh, read your work, and this is what they took away, and so what did they get wrong? Okay, so the the first thing is that my work is. First, about avoiding tail risk. Right. Basically, if you want to do well, you must first survive. And it's not like a separable condition. So one is going to avoid fragilities. And it turns out that as much as the Federal Reserve induces fragility in a system, and, and, and as much as I dislike uh, Bernanke, uh, it turns out that Bitcoin is a lot worse. And it is itself a very fragile uh, commodity, and it got, of course, cartelled. You know, a bunch of people, uh, it's a very small number of people, start controlling it. And it's fragile in a sense that if one day, if, if the, uh, you know, all the miners go to the beach for one day or for, for an hour, uh, it's gone. Whereas if you have gold, I have a necklace here, a gold necklace. If I leave it on the ground for 100,000 years, it'll still be gold. It may lose its financial value, but its physical quality will, 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 will not uh, be altered. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's just a book entry that needs to be maintained and will collapse. Plus, a lot of other things promised by Bitcoin that are not delivered. Like it was meant to be a transactional thing, turned out to be a speculative item. So I realized quickly that I made a mistake with Bitcoin. Like I made a mistake by avoiding aerobic exercise. And of course, uh, uh, yeah, I, was, I was at some point an owner of Bitcoin. I publicly said that I made a mistake and I went short Bitcoin later. But it was not good for the system. And I outlined it in a paper that was published in Quantitative Finance where you look at, hey, what's the currency? What's an inflation hedge? What is a refuge investment? And Bitcoin satisfied none of these. So so people, of course, they got angry because because they had the feeling that they, they're going to blame you for changing your mind. They don't realize that uh, I'm, I'm not selling a, a, you know, a recipe. I'm selling a process. Mm. The certo is the way of thinking, the way of approaching things. And if you realize that something is fragile, immediately do something about it. 
So, and, 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 and remarkably, it's the same cluster of people who read Antifragile and thought that, hey, you know, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Let's, uh, yeah. let's get infected with the vaccine, with, uh, with, uh, vaccine, with, uh, with COVID, and uh, let's ignore COVID because it's going to make us stronger. It's going to kill a few people. So that kind of eugenism, that kind of stuff, I, I realized was inimical to me, profoundly inimical to me. So it's the same crowd that was denying COVID, saying, hey, you know, uh, it's uh, just a virus uh, that's going to make you stronger. And they didn't realize that they explained the antifragile, jumping one uh, foot will make your bones stronger, but a thousand feet will not help them too much. I mean, it may help, you know, the caretaker and, uh, and people who organize funerals, but not, not you. But so, so I realized very quickly there's a cluster of people who were both into Bitcoin as a very, going to very naive reasoning, extremely naive reasoning, thinking, hey, you know, it's an inflation hedge. And as we saw, it was a reverse inflation hedge. But the good thing that I, I, I figured out quickly to pull out in time, uh, in the sense that it lost its value and we realized there was inflation. In the same group of people were into conspiracies, all general conspiracies. And that's not the crowd I want. And that's not, that's not the crowd I want to be associated with. You mentioned that Bitcoin was bad for the system. And I think that's sort of the connective tissue that leads into some more recent events with the banking system. But can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, How do you see Bitcoin okay, actually let's, let's impacting? Yeah. Okay, let's look at why why we have Bitcoin and why we are talking about Bitcoin. Effectively, it's the incompetence of uh, what I call Bernankism, you know, because sometimes you've got to put name to a uh, tendency. That the Federal Reserve job is not to do structural things. The Federal Reserve job is to engage in monetary policies, and typically the short-term monetary policies to... Uh, and, and, and their mission was, and has been, and, and, and will be, the, the stability of the, the United States currency. So the job is to ease when, when economic condition and you know threatened inflation and when, when in hard economic condition. But, the, but, but you cannot replace a structural policy with a monetary policy. In other words, we had a problem with debt. And you can't solve the debt problem by putting interest rates at zero for a long time. Or if you put interest rates at zero, it should be for a short period of time while looking for an alternative. So what they did for 15 years, they put interest rates at zero. And then that does create tumors. Well, the first, that, so that's a, the root of everything is interest rates at zero, which ironically created Bitcoin. And of course, created all this, uh, um, I would say, uh, Ponzi-like class of you know, investments because there's no time value of money anymore. Your discount rate—you don't know what even you know what the discount rate is—and we create a generation of people who don't know the the cost of funds, the cost of money. So, and and, and anyone with 15 years of experience in finance, uh, you know, and no more, doesn't know anything about interest rates. So. Interest rates at zero creates tumors. Real estate values go up dramatically because the cost of holding a, a mansion is close to nothing or was close to nothing. And created a class of investment called you know, VC funds. And, and, and these were, were, in the old days, were promising you cash flow, okay, future cash flow. Today, they're promising you uh, a round of funding where you're going to sell it to someone else. Mm. So it, we, we moved from uh, uh, the classical cash flow model, or even if you're negative cash flow, the, the promise of future cash flow to the promise of selling the company to someone else. And you have billionaires in Silicon Valley who, you know, got rich from companies that never made a penny. So that's that's the background. And of course, you're going to have a story like Bitcoin take off because it doesn't cost that gold. Since you mentioned it, I'm curious, COVID specifically, and your criticism of anti-vaxxers. And I find that one of the things that I think is interesting is it's not clear to me how you think about these problems because, they're, okay, the vaccine is fairly new. It seems to be relatively 
untested as a technology. And when there are other sort of scientific advances that you've really uh, recoiled against. For example, I think you were very critical about GMO crops and you worried yes, about yes. the tail risks posed by those. So can you talk a yeah. little bit about your framework and thinking about why something okay, like no. the COVID vaccine you're comfortable with, whereas something like GMO crops to you creates an uncomfortable level of tail risk? Okay, so but before we start, let's say that you're not, you cannot compare uh, vaccines to GMOs because vaccines are tested in individuals. So you can see the side effect in individuals where the GMOs would be systemic. You don't okay. know if they spread in the environment. And then also you're not taking the vaccine, you know, for because uh, for, for, because you think it's uh, tastes good or, or it's, you know, it's going to be a pleasant experience. You're taking the vaccine, uh, you've got to plot the vaccine versus COVID and COVID was not something benign. So comparing, it's a risk management difference between two items. And two, two things I'd like to mention here. The first one is that very rapidly, you know, I, I waited a little bit and then very rapidly I saw that I had very large number of vaccinated people and no side effects. And people said, well, we need more time. They didn't understand that you can replace sample size, time with sample size in the sense that if it's something related to genetic mistakes that are going to take place or something of a genetic nature, uh, like cancer, for example, that it would be the equivalent, that the large sample size compensates for lack of time, actually overcompensates, because we have the mm -hmm. illusion that after Hiroshima, people got cancer about 12 and a half years later. That's not true. Some people got cancer within a, a few months. And but the distribution, there's a distribution because you need X number of mutations. Like when you go to Las Vegas, uh, for an individual to win uh, eight times in a row, take uh, decades, years of waiting. But if you have a billion people in a casino, you're going to have that, you know, every hour. Right. So this is where this, this is where very rapidly I, I, I realized that vaccine did not really pose uh, the, a, a threat of that nature. And, and I wrote technical uh, comments on that. But to go back to the pandemic, what would, you know, the, the, my thinking, you know, that basically my specialty is fat tail events. See, I've done, spent all my life dealing with that central problem. How do you do statistical tools for fat tail stuff like that? So when the pandemic happened, I started publishing in that field because uh, people didn't realize that you have to think differently when it comes to fat tails. You see, you cannot take averages. You shouldn't do naive forecasting. And, and got involved in a few polemical discussions, but we published like seven or eight uh, papers in, in journals uh, on on uh, on that, including masks. And I may have one on vaccine if, if people keep you know denying differential the risk differential between vaccine and and the disease. But there's a lot of stuff people don't get about uh, COVID. Uh, the first one I would say is that it is not something that affects the old. It affects everybody in proportion to their mortality. So it's not particularly so. In other words, if you say, okay, it's only the old, then you should uh, you should say, okay, let's stop dealing with cancer because cancer affects the elderly a lot disproportionately. Or, or let's stop cardiology. It costs too much money. You know, gym bros don't need it because they're 38 years old. Right? Um, it's, the same, it's the same argument. It kills us in proportion to age. So in other words, if your, your, your mortality risk goes up by 8%, regardless of above the age of 30, of course, above uh, some threshold. Uh, and, and that's not well understood. So it's not an old person problem. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, disease is an old person problem, not mm. uh, COVID by itself. Right. So there are a bunch of things people didn't get. But I, you, you, you see, I was known uh, initially by you and other people before the Black Swan as the author of Food by Randomness. And, and that book was misunderstood uh, uh, initially. And I was saying that there is, I'm not saying there's, you know, a, a, no skills, that there are no skills. I'm saying the, the world is more random than you think. But I'm not saying it's all random. Well, Actually, and, I wanted... And, yes, go ahead. Just, and let me finish one point about oh, sure. food by randomness connected to the idea. So but one of the, the, the messages of food by randomness is we tend to be swayed by anecdotes. Mm. Right. And I noticed that over time, things got worse. I mean, the Encircle sold, I don't know, seven, eight, nine million copies worldwide. 
but at the same time, and a lot of people have done it, who made the same mistake, people are swayed by the anecdote. So, so, so whether it's uh, COVID, whether it's vaccines, whether it's naive story, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's uh, uh, stuff about elections, we're swayed by the anecdote. So our world is becoming more complex, requires more statistical sophistication, while uh, social media is driving us to the, right. the, the most uh, uh, primitive way of thinking. So, sorry to interrupt your trace. No, no, no. Uh, this is actually exactly what I, I wanted to ask you. Something that I've actually always wanted to ask you for a long time is, is there a tension between, you know, you say in a lot of your works that we shouldn't trust experts necessarily. You should be wary of, you know, I, I think you call them either bullshitters or other other words, but, but wait, but on the other hand, you know, with something like the vaccine, I doubt that the average person has the scientific background to look at the literature and say, oh, th this makes sense or it doesn't. And, and in that case, it seems like we, we should be trusting experts. So how do you square those two things? Yeah, no, I, I made the tableau in the black swan to answer your, your the precise question. I uh, had uh, to explain which fields, in which field the expert is an expert and it's which field the expert is a, what I call a BS member, okay? And the difference has to do with fat dates, okay? If uh, the micro is much easier to micro BS than micro BS. Hmm. So in that tableau, I said the dentist is gonna be an expert at dentistry. The right. plumber is an expert at uh, being a plumber, but the macroeconomist, we're not sure, is an expert at macroeconomics. And the same thing happens in medicine. Epidemiologists were not really experts at what's going on because it's fat tailed, but doctor, the doctor and visual doctor is going to be an expert at that. And we're dealing with thin tailed processes when you look at time series for vaccines and, 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 and things like that. Vaccine is a thin tailed thing, it's not a fat tailed one. So, the uh, and that's the difference with GMO. So, thin tailed versus fat tailed. And of course, it would be too complex uh, to explain here, but uh, I explained it in uh, the Black Swan. The difference between the income of a speculator and the income of a dentist. One has winner, winner take all effects, the other one is more say, uh, narrowly distributed. Uh, so, this is where, where I saw uh, mainly the difference between expert and non expert. Later on, I did some more thinking and scanning the game, say, how can you solve the problem? And I said, okay, the difference is scanning the game. That if you have skin in the game, then you have survival, and then we know if you're an expert. Or if there's any way to bust your claims, okay, and 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 make you exit the pool, then then of course an expert will you have, will have a filter eliminating uh, pseudo experts, uh, particularly those who represent risks uh, for others. A surgeon who you know does bad surgeries is going to exit the pool. So there is a mechanism in surgery. There is a mechanism uh, in, in, in economic life. A grocer who, who doesn't understand, uh, you know, balance sheets or doesn't understand cash flow will go out of business. But there are places where the process is delayed, namely uh, technology, uh, namely macroeconomics, maybe economics. But I, I guess the difference, I keep going back to the difference. Say your plumber is an expert at plumbing, but forecaster uh, is not an expert at forecasting. And there are fields where you have a lot of BS, like for example, uh, psychology, psychology, or what I mean, academic psychology, not clinical, the one that deals with biases and stuff like that. And, and they're, it's all BS and they can't be caught, whereas medicine is, is, is on firm ground. Of course, and it's not perfect. Medicine made a lot of mistakes, but it's fundamentally self-correct. Hmm. So I, I, I get the distinction, but I guess my other question is you yourself as a flaneur and um, you know a thinker, you sort of you you go from topic to topic to topic, and and you know you say that let you're. Let me tell you my rule. Let me tell you my yeah. rule, Casey. Okay, my mm -hmm. rule is I publish in peer reviewed journal that these topics mm. too professional, and that, that's my problem with Peterson and all the guys. Is that I speak about men, but I have seven uh, papers, and I mean a lot <laughs> more than than the local doctor. In, in medical uh, uh, topics, okay, whether it's published in medical journals or published in other scientific uh, fields. I talk about genetics. I have two published and 
two coming in genetics. So actually, one published, one accepted, one and two coming in genetics. So I basically I never talked about the subject unless I engaged the expert, and that was my fight with a lot of people. Hmm. So, so, so my, my idea is not necessary to publish in peer-reviewed journal if you are in a practical profession, like if you're a truck driver, uh. you can talk about trucks, you don't need to publish. But if you're uh, sitting in, a, in, a, in an ivory tower or something somewhere, you need to engage the professional, not the, you know, not be an expert uh, on, on Twitter, just on Twitter. And that's my rule. <laughs> and, and people don't realize that I'm subjecting myself to that discipline. Hmm. Well, so I got 80, uh, I, I did 80 papers after Black Swan, 80 papers, technical papers. Why? Not because, uh, you know, it's not for the image, it's because I require from others some kind of technical expertise before listening to them. Speaking of, I guess, uh, bullshitters, and speaking of yes. Twitter, and speaking of yeah. people who say a lot of things on topics that they either are not experts on or have not published in a rigorous manner. There is and a certain ninety like percent of Twitter. <laughs> that's true, but there is a certain class of people that Nassim, you have been going back and forth with venture capitalists for several years now. Many of the prominent ones have fashioned themselves as these sort of like philosopher kings, weighing in on everything from tech to politics to what the Fed should do to declining fertility rates in the West and all these things that they're up in arms about. And they've gotten really loud about how banking works in the wake of the failure of SVB. You seem to have a, a special place in your heart of disdain for many of these people. <laughs> because, of course, your natural inclination is to believe that venture capitalists uh, do a great job, that they uh, contribute to society, that it's thanks to them that we have this uh, whatever computer uh, program we're using now to, you know, for this uh, podcast. So that's the inclination. But when you scratch, you realize that maybe, maybe, maybe that was a game, but the game has changed dramatically. And you have a bunch of uh, people who package companies. They're good at packaging companies. And of course, the thing has positive characteristics. And not only that, but they think that society owes them something because we use an iPhone. <laughs> okay, so so they have they have this feeling. Hey, you know what? You're using an iPhone, therefore you owe me something. Therefore, come in and bail me out. Okay. Plus, a lot of these are libertarian, but it so happens that a lot of people are libertarian until they uh, <laughs> have the first drawdown. Okay, so so VC. I mean, in principle, it's a very noble profession. All professions are noble in principle, but you want to avoid the rent seeking by that profession as a whole. And this is why every profession, although you have peer review within a profession, you know, like in economics, you have to just make sure there's uh, some accountability, external accountability, or an adult supervision from the outside. And it looks like VCs uh, are not uh, doing what they claim to do. I mean, think of all these billionaires, and you realize that there are a lot of these billionaires are billionaires from funding. Uh, if Tracy... Uh, and I started the company tomorrow. We put uh, ten thousand dollars each. Is it okay? To, is it crazy? We we'll put ten thousand dollars. I I think okay. maybe I can afford ten. Tracy's in for yeah. Tracy's okay, in okay. for ten thousand. She's got back from the okay, Seychelles. Okay, ten thousand. Okay. So we, we put in. Okay. So 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 Tracy and I put in ten thousand dollars, and now we have companies worth twenty thousand dollars, right? And then we decide to sell to Joe one percent of the company. Mm. For a thousand dollars, guess what? Tracy and I now are uh, you know have forty nine point some percent of a you know our twenty thousand dollars became almost fifty thousand dollars. Joe, you're good for one k, right? I can I can swing exactly. that. Yeah. So exactly. So and then you have a friend who's going to spend another k to buy point one percent and the company and so on. This is a lot of lot of lot. These Ponzi-like characteristics are yeah. present in, in a lot of systems. It's just that, you know, of course, it, it, there is value somewhere. They produce good stuff. We had uh, a lot of, recently, a lot of technologies. But you have to beware that, that there's a lot of smoke. And also, 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 they realize that that game has, was fueled by low interest rates. Right. Well, so that is the general the sort of like the general theory, the general case against 
uh, listening to a lot of these individuals on every topic they wish to opine on. Can you just talk a little bit about the specifics, particularly in the collapse of SVB? And you've criticized several of them, which we don't need to mention by name, but about their level of understanding of the banking system and finance and finance risks, et cetera. What do you, uh, you know, what do you think, is it just a sort of bias, sort of like, you know, the, the cliche, there's no libertarians in a bank run or something, or is there a deeper misunderstanding that many of them have about how the structure of the banking system works? Yeah, I mean, for, first, uh, they, they couldn't, I mean, many of them uh, didn't understand the difference between losing money for credit, uh, you know, invest for credit uh, reasons or versus losing money because of the term structure shifts. You see, that bank SVB made a mistake of investing long term. First of all, and that's pretty much uh, uh, the the way we think about it uh, at Universa, that if you look at convex versus concave investment, you really have to have a deep misunderstanding of finance to invest very long-term in bonds that pay you no interest. <laughs> because basically you have no upside and all downside from there, you see? So, so these banks were very fragile and they invested, uh, and it's a curved play that the U.S. Uh, government is going to pay that debt. And, and uh, don't use it to uh, sing the praises of Bitcoin because Bitcoin suffered from it. And effectively, Bitcoin rallied when they bailed out the banks. So I'm giving, okay, one example. But then again, let me tell you, when you become prominent, you're responsible for your uh, words because you may influence others. Right. And, and that's my rule. I mean, you can, whatever I say in public about public and uh, in, in private about public matters, okay, is public. And, and I should be held accountable for all my mistakes. And I made a lot of mistakes. I've been accountable for a lot of my mistakes. But you just, you got to be self-correcting. Just on the venture capital model, I mean, I, I take the funding point and I, I wholly agree with it. But it seems like also one of the reasons that VC and tech investments in general became so popular during an era of low interest rates was that, you know, if you can't get a decent return from investing in traditional finance, financial assets, then why not basically purchase a lottery ticket for the next Google or the next Amazon or, you know, even Bitcoin at times has been described as a lottery ticket. Is there an overlap between trying to identify tail risks, which, you know, almost by definition are unknowable, and that kind of model of trying to purchase a lottery ticket for the next big thing. Because it seems like both those two things, you, you, you never really know what the next black swan event is going to be or the next big technological innovation. Uh, this is a great question, because people keep telling me, you like to engage in uh, trades that have a uh, high probability of mm. uh, small loss and small probability of large loss. Okay. Why don't you just buy a lottery ticket? Hmm. And I want to explain the, the, the condition, the number one condition, is to have positive expected return. You see, you, that, you, that right. you, your bet must have, you, you must not be a turkey. In other words, buying a lottery ticket is completely irrational. Do it in the long run, you're not going to make any money. But if you engage in tailor risk trades, we believe that the, the me, myself, which just published a paper explaining option pricing, 50 years after Black Trolls to explain that a lot of people think these options are expensive. They're like expensive lottery ticket effects because they have the wrong model. We made, we made the paper public. But the problem of the, the central problem is that you should focus on expected value. And, and a lot of places, and to repeat, that appear to be a negative expected value and finance reflects positive expected value and vice versa. It's very rational to go buy into VC if you think that your dollar will turn at $1,000. But I doubt it will happen now. The story is oversold. And that was a low interest rate uh, game. Because mm -hmm. now people are going to focus on profitability and these companies may not survive. Mm -hmm. And if you buy, by the way, if you buy into a lot of, it will, VC has a lot of companies. So if you buy into a lot of companies, you lose that skewed attribute. So you no longer have you, you would have hmm. a, a symmetry with small losses, big gains. If I invest in a million companies with small loss, big gains, okay, I would have steady returns if I have positive effective return. What did Sam Bankman Fried misunderstand about positive EV? Because my understanding is he, that him and his whole crew thought, well, huge risks were worth it if there's even a slight 
edge if there's a slight positive EV. And of course, they took the ultimate risk and it blew up, but they seem to think that these risks were worthwhile because in part, they wanted to make a lot of money, in part because they thought it was important to save the world, to make money to save the world from perceived threats, whether it's AI or anything else. What did he misunderstand about uh, okay, so, probabilistic thinking? Okay, th thanks, Joe. This is this is great to talk about him, not because it's him, but because of that group of people. Yeah, we have this entire collection of young individuals who think that the past does not exist. <laughs> so when I was a yeah. trader in my twenties, I picked the brain of every older trader who had survived. And that was not just me. When I look back, I see people who have survived, same attitude. So these people make tabula rasa. And, and I remember writing uh, comments, citing my friend, Tom Holland, who said the Romans had no cult of the youth. See, and mm -hmm. that was, and we have a cult of the youth and they have a cult of themselves. And to me, being young in finance is, is, is necessarily, right, a, a bad thing. Yeah simply because of lack of experience, but also of that culture. So in, in their world, they thought that if they understood the blockchain, they did not need to understand finance. And, and, and uh, th so that's the root of the problem. The root of the problem is they think that finance is a computer program. Finance has vastly more texture than that, it requires a lot more uh, say, introspection when you, when, you, when you pick a decision to consider many, many, many more factors. Finance is, as you know, very complicated. It's just like we say science is hard. You say finance is harder. Had as a fortune cookie approach to finance, a simplified fortune cookie approach, and it was generalized to tons of people. And, uh, you know, many of them became like him, uh, paper billionaires. And, and now they're going to end up like him living in their parents' uh, basement because they, they have no skills. Uh, programming is <laughs> with chat GDP is a skill that's no longer going to be uh, in high demand. So, so that's the tragedy. The tragedy is much more general than uh, than, than what he missed. It's, right. it's the, the general it's the approach. Hey, we don't need this. I mean, there are elementary mistakes these people make when looking at time series. For example, tell you look at Bitcoin. If you bought it four years ago, you had these returns. Yes, that's not how we look at investments. We look at peak to value drawdowns, the structure of drawdown, because. You're not going to go back in a time machine and buy it four years ago. You're buying it now, okay? And you have to worry about the next four years, not the past four years. So they don't understand how to present returns, how to compare returns, how to discuss inflation. Basic things about monetary policy are missed. Talking about someone, you know, at that age group, uh, educated, supposedly educated, and making mistakes that I think a clerk uh, who, you know, or a trainee, you know, and you know, trainees, that their main function is to serve coffee in the trading room, that trainees, you know, would, 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 <laughs> would know immediately the mistake. So the, the, so the world has lost in some kind of sophistication, and we're going to get it back. It's evolution. These guys go bust, and those trained in, with more respect of, uh, for historical understanding will uh, prevail. Mm. So in the end, uh, the guys who had last word are the oldest investors around, like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. <laughs> Universa position nowadays. Talk to us about you know all, all these ideas. How are you putting them into practice? Okay, the only the thing I would say about Universa is that in 2023 the positioning is identical to the one in 2013, and identical to the one we'll have in 2051. Okay, so if my cycling allows me to survive that long. So in other words, we are providing a structural service with portfolios to prevent blow-ups, to eliminate that tail. And for us, just like blocking noisy people on Twitter and Hansa's Twitter, eliminating your tail risk allows you to make any mistake you want with your investments. A lot of people seem to intuitively like the idea of tail risk funds, buying protection, and you know, yes. for the probably for the reason you like. It's like, yeah, we're all gonna make mistakes but I want to sleep at night. And exactly. so I want to have some sort of hedge or something like that. And, you know, buy puts or whatever it is. But that doesn't seem, obviously, like, 
That's that's costly in the short term. Yeah, and there's no free lunch, deception. right? And there's no free lunch, right? No, no, because no, it, no, 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 no. That's our, our our problem is that if you buy what we call the sucker spit, you might yeah. as well give your money to charities, and I can right. give you some charities. <laughs> there's one in Lebanon. If they need money, I can give you their name. The, the problem with Taylor's scheduling is that just like uh, Sam Bankman Street thought, hey, finance was easy because he figured out a few technical things. They, they, they had the illusion, hey, well, that's great, let's do it. The devil is in the execution. It's very, very complicated. Very, very complicated, and it required a lot of experience. Conceptually, yeah. though, setting a, conceptually. Conceptually. How conceptually, is it different? It's, yeah. It's, it's a huge difference because the return you're going to have when you, uh, I mean, I'm not supposed to talk uh, return. Sure, uh, sure. Okay, we don't have to talk. So I'm going to say conceptually, uh, the the the, but you can look up everything. But uh, there is a huge difference between the naive tail hedger yeah. and the experienced tail hedger, and I leave it at that. Okay. Because uh, sizing, the time, the there are a lot of things involved, particularly liquidity that uh, where how you buy. Because the difference between bid and ask for options is monstrous. Just practically, you know, you you mentioned the difference between um, experienced and naive tail risk hedgers, but practically, is it easier or harder or cheaper or more expensive to buy, you know, really big tail risk insurance nowadays? Like, how has that process actually evolved since the 1980s, for instance? I think that people are even more naive today than they were in the 1980s. Hmm. Believe it or not, the, the people are even more naive than, than, than they were right after the stock market crash. I don't think that we have enough financial sophistication. Maybe short term arbitrage disappear, but things are more structural, like how do you price uh, tail risk? No, people are very naive. Plus, they quite don't quite, people also don't understand the following argument. It's your own money. You understand very well that you don't want to, you want to sleep at night and, and there's some things you don't, don't want to lose all your money. Okay. And, and like why people never buy a house unless they can have insurance on it, particularly if the house represents three, four times their net worth. You don't buy a house, you know, before right. making sure that if it's if there's a fire, uh, you're not going to have a huge liability. And, and actually, very often, you know, like when, when you drive, you're obligated to have tail mm-hmm. insurance. But then when it comes to a portfolio, those who trade their own money or who invest their own money will find it natural. To say, I'm not going to invest unless, and the tail risk is expensive. Guess what? I'm not going to invest in that. And then you have the second category people are paid to invest. And you say, oh, well, this is expensive. You know, I'm going to do that. Of course, it's not your money. And that's, that's the skin of the game problem. Speaking of tail risk, this week that we're recording, several people signed an open letter saying that we should halt development of technologies along the lines of AI and that there is an imminent risk, at least some people believe, of these computers becoming so powerful that they wipe out all living things on Earth sounds like the ultimate tail risk. I'm not going to ask you how you would hedge against that because I doubt that would be a scenario worth hedging for. But is that a tail risk in your view? Are we no, on, mean, a, are we on track to develop computers that will eliminate life as we know it? I don't think so. Well, number one is AI. I mean, people are worried that chat GDP will put them out of business. And that's why they issue these calls. Mm. I'm worried about that. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> chat GDP is not running red lights, traffic lights. It's not running things that are consequential. And when AI starts running these things, then we'll talk about it. But for the time being, we'll talk about development. And, and it looks like it's a probabilistic machine. Right. Uh, no more, no less, with the defects of probabilistic machines. And the reason I, 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 um, um, I talk a little bit about AI is because as a statistician, it's just uh, nothing but uh, nonlinear statistics. That's what, what it is, right? It's, it's a statistical device, and it worked as a statistical device, but we know the shortcomings of statistical machineries, and it has all the shortcomings. So I'm, I'm not even worried. Uh, nobody's going to use uh, that, that AI for things beyond automated searches. or uh, It just automates a lot of things that can be automated. And unfortunately, 
a lot of people feel threatened because they see the the discourse by 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 the chat GDP very similar to their own mm-hmm. because it's a bullshit. To, it's a bullshit to, <laughs> to, to the, I think this would be threatened. So far, I don't see anything as far as uh, society. I don't see it's not like with the pandemic where you can see something spreading. What's the tail risk that you think investors are most underestimating nowadays? Okay, it's the fact that uh, zero interest rates are very unnatural. And if you raise rates to a normal level, and what's normal level, say between 4 and 6%, which the Fed you know, would like to have higher interest rates, but there are some pressures. You'd like to have a, a higher base because if you're at 4% interest rate, then you can lower it if you have a crisis. You can, you can go down, you can go up. But if your interest rate's at zero and you have further crisis, you don't know what to do. So, or, or at least you can play with interest rates. We have to look for something else that's just more dangerous. So I think that if you look at interest rates higher than 3% long term as a discount rate, then equities are in trouble because they're not priced for that. Hmm. So this is where, where you're going to look at it. You're going to look at structurally the equities are in trouble. But I think that many things will, uh, you know, the equity would be the, the last drop, say, because a lot of things that would be in trouble first. I have two final yeah, questions. Uh, yeah. One is very yeah. short. Do you still eat squid ink pasta? And where's the best <laughs> squid ink pasta? These are the, the important questions. Where's the best? Okay, uh, this is important, yeah. Yeah. If you want good squid ink pasta, you, if you want good squid ink, no pasta, you got to go to Lebanon. There's okay. no, the Beirut recipes is the best. And if you want squid ink, good squid ink pasta, you got to go to Southern Italy. Okay. If you want squid ink risotto, Northern Italy. And then if you, you know, and then I would say lower on, on the list, Spain, you go for the arrows, uh, the, the paella, you know, the, yeah. the black paella. Oh, yeah. So the black rice. So, so I, I uh, New York, uh, you know, I, you know I, I don't recommend too much. Okay. Uh, but I can cook. For, I, I'm learning to cook it. And then within the two, three years, I'd be able to cook to produce a decent dish. Oh, well, Tracy and I would love to uh, do a live video episode coming over to your uh, house sometime and having you prepare us a squid ink dish uh, in, in three in, years in, time. In 2026. In three years time, yeah. Well, yeah. so then one one last question, and I really appreciate the time. I have to say, if I'm if I'm being just like totally blunt, I know that you say that many of your readers of anti-fragile and some of your other works misunderstood your work. And I get that. But I, I, I also think I, I mean, if I'm just being blunt, I think like your tone has changed. You seem a little less bombastic than previous times we have chatted. You yourself have gotten no, into because cycling. you agree with me. Let me tell no, you. Maybe, no, maybe. No, no. It's because okay. you agree with me. Okay. It's because a lot of <laughs> people no, find me okay. more bombastic. Because you agree. Because right. There's always this bias. If you agree with the message. All right. That's fair. See? You, 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 you give a lot of flag to the messenger. And if yeah, you fair, enough, message, fair enough. Fair enough. It's perfect a good messenger. Point. No perfect message. So that, that's what one thing is a shooter messenger. I have, okay, well, let me to go back to um, anti fragile, which is just a, a brief summary in case people are listening because they know what it means. It means that we need stressors. We need low grade, a lot of low grade stresses, you see. And, and uh, like companies need to encounter uh, a few problems because you up regulate and you get uh, stronger after that. But it doesn't mean that we should tolerate tailor risk. It's all conditional on avoiding tailor risk. Right. And, and, and if you get stronger in jumping, uh, you know, one foot, uh, 100 meters are going to kill you. So just, just don't take the idea too far. It's, it's very local. That's the idea of anti-fragile. And an anti-fragile investment is not something called anti-fragile by some web thinker. You know, an anti-fragile investment is something that reacts very well to the misfortunes uh, in the market, and that definitely is not Bitcoin. <laughs> Nassim, Nicholas Taleb, this was a thrill. Thank you so much for coming on, and I'm looking forward to dinner at your house in 2026 and another episode <laughs> in the year. Yeah, in Lebanon. We'll come anywhere. Tracy and I, I think Tracy and I would, oh, love, I would to, love to go to Lebanon. We would yeah. love to visit you in Lebanon. We'll bring a crew. We'll film it. It'll be great. And then we'll uh, have you back on again in 15 years, you know, assuming the AI hasn't killed us all. But uh, thank you so much. This was a real, uh, great. real pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Very nice. Very nice talking thank to you. Thank you. Thanks, Nassim. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.
So, Tracy, the, the, the big question is, did uh, Nassim <laughs> change or do suddenly he says things that flatter our biases so suddenly we perceive him to have changed? I mean, I imagine it's a bit of both, but I think my – first of all, I enjoyed that conversation that was so fun. a lot. That was so fun. But secondly, I think my big, like, how I learned to stop worrying and love the Taleb moment is – you kind of have to realize that a lot of the criticisms and things he says about others kind of apply to himself, which doesn't necessarily which doesn't necessarily make them untrue. They're still very valuable insights, but it's either, you know, you grasp that and it frustrates you enormously or you just roll with it and appreciate the insights nonetheless. And I think I'm I'm in the stage of my life where I'm just going to roll with it. That's so funny, especially because he specifically <laughs> is like, no, 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 I, I publish in academic journals. I am not a all-purpose bullshitter. You know, one thing that I think throughout, and I have to say for years, a point of his that I've always, whatever cycle he's in, whoever hates him at a given moment, that I've always respected, that I've always thought was true, is his point about the difference between a plumber and an economist or the difference between a doctor and an epidemiologist, which I think is like a really like insightful true point that like, you know, a, a plumber is an expert on plumbing. They've they've fixed a pipe or a right. toilet or a sewer system or a shower system thousands and thousands of times. There is very little new that you can ever show a plumber that they haven't seen and there is a certain level of skill set and ability to solve things that one can only get after having fixed a lot of toilets or pipes, uh, which and that's why there's, you know, the whole apprenticeship thing. And I think that is like a really useful heuristic to talking to anyone, which is like, are they really an expert? Have they done something that's like built up deep expertise or are they just sort of like kind of winging it? Right. I, I think that's a completely valid point. And there's only so much expertise that I think one person can really have. You know, you mm -hmm. can't expect people to be an expert in everything. But on the other hand, you know, he talked a lot about the world becoming more complex. Mm. And I think this is where the instinct comes to try to understand more and more things. Because, yes, a plumber, he's seen many, many clogged toilets and he can probably fix them in his sleep. But then when something unexpected happens, like, for instance, COVID and a yeah. supply chain crisis that impacts his ability to get, I don't know, those little like toilet pump things that seems to, like that's where the instinct to yeah. try to understand the whole comes from. And the irony in all of this is that like that's a lot of what Taleb spends his time doing, right, is trying to identify um, and presumably position for these sort of unexpected risks. You know, there is interesting the difference between, in his view, the vaccine and GMOs, one being systemic, one be the other being that yeah. trials of thousands and thousands of people is, of course, and intuitively, there's you know statistics, but just is a is a substitute for time in the way that GMO crops. There's no way to shortcut the process of like, well, what is going to happen to the entire ecosystem of agriculture over the next hundred or thousand years because we just literally haven't. There's no way to substitute that time yet. Anyway. I really like that conversation. I was sad during that period when Taleb blocked me, and I'm glad we are both. <laughs> I'm glad we are both unblocked because I am very enjoying. I'm watching. I'm enjoying watching him his cycling journey. I'm enjoying watching his fights, and I just think he's an interesting guy. Absolutely, and uh, I guess I'm looking forward to having Squid Ink yes. pasta in uh, in three years' uh, time. It, in, uh, in, all I can say Beirut. is. It, there's going to be a lot of pressure, though, because it better be good after three years of study. Right? Well, you know, the thing is, he's been talking about squidding forever. And so the fact that he himself says it's going to be another three years before he's ready to, like, cook it is like, uh, I, it's, you know, he's a, he's a journeyman. It sounds like he is himself an apprentice or journeyman squidding chef who is not there yet. Maybe we should do a come dine with me style cook off yeah. where each of us each of us attempts to cook squid ink pasta in a different location <laughs> and then we rate each other. All oh, right, yeah. um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guest on Twitter if you're not blocked. His handle is at NN Taleb. 
Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dash Bennett at Dashbot. And check out all of our podcasts under the handle at podcasts. And if you want more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where you can find transcripts, a blog, a newsletter. And if you want even more, we have a really fun community online on Discord where a bunch of listeners hang out 24-7 and chat about things like markets, finance, economics, energy, water, AI, and all the things we talk about. Go check that out. Discord.gg slash oddlots is the invite link. It's really fun. I've been spending a lot of time there. Go hang out. Thanks for listening.